Tonight we are continuing uh, in, our devo- in our Bible study of uh, the book of Revelation. And we are in Revelation chapter 18 tonight. And uh, tonight is a relatively short chapter in the regards to what goes on in uh, Revelation chapter 18. And we'll, we'll see what all happens here uh, shortly. But uh, tonight I want us to go ahead and remind you of sort of where we're at and what led, where we're at in chapter ending chapter 17. So Stacy, if you will, share with us the, uh, the timetable there. And uh, so far what we've talked about, we've, we've talked about all of the judgments and everything that leads up to just before the glorious appearing. It's the end of the tribulation period. And so uh, things have gotten really bad on the earth and, you know, people are uh, coming to faith in Christ uh, during this period. But uh, what we talked about last week, the destruction of the religious side of Babylon, uh, the world, one world religion uh, that will take control shortly after the rapture. It will take control and, and have control for the first half of the tribulation and it will control um, or seem to control the Antichrist. And then at the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist will basically uh, do away with the world religion and that is, has been controlling a lot of things and will institute through the work of the false prophet worship of him as a god. And uh, as a reminder, at that midpoint of the tribulation, that is when the, the Antichrist will die in some form or fashion, and will be, there will be a false resurrection where he will be indwelt by Satan, and it will mimic the resurrection of Christ. And so last week, we were in chapter 17, and we were talking about the destruction of that religious Babylon as chapter 17 talks about. Now, tonight we're in chapter 18 talking about the destruction of the city of Babylon, the, the governmental or the commercial uh, part of the city of Babylon that uh, will be rebuilt. And so where we're at tonight, as we'll see, is going to point out that we are a, once again at the end of the tribulation. Now, it seems like we're jumping back and forth and around, but the book of Revelation, as it was revealed to John, is it takes these parentheses at times and, and shows us things that are occurring throughout the entire tribulation period. And then other times it's very specific that we know when these uh, timetable of events are occurring. And so uh, as we get started tonight in your notes, it talks about how some Bible scholars put the destruction in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 and basically say that they're all one event. And the author of our uh, commentary does a great job of explaining in there why chapter 17 and chapter 18 are two different events at two different times, but they reference the same city. That's basically all that happens is that they, the, the location of these events are in the same place. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. The first thing that we see is... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to read Revelation chapter 18. And then once we get through reading that, we'll go through this and it'll all make a little bit more sense to us. So look with me in Revelation chapter 18. It says, beginning in verse 1, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen, I am not a widow. 
and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Now remember, I'm going to continue reading, but remember, we're talking about the commercial or the governmental side of the city of Babylon as we're reading, okay? And so then... Uh, it says in verse 9, it says, When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her, mom, at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out. Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off when they see the smoke of her burning and they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. Now that is a very long and very descriptive set of verses that share with us the destruction of the city of Babylon during this time. And if you notice that it really, it takes on uh, this, uh, this repetitive notion. It talks about how, um, how the city is brought to ruin but then it talks about how uh, the kings of the earth, how they uh, weeped and mourned over the destruction. Then there is the merchants, those who uh, were businessmen, and, and how they weeped over the, and mourned over the death or the destruction of the city of Babylon. Then the sea captains, who again were weeping and mourning over it. And then there is this angel that uh, tosses a millstone into the sea, and we'll talk about all of that in just a moment. But as we see back in chapter 17, there was destruction of the woman sitting on the back of the beast. And that was representative of the religious, the religion that will take hold after the, after the rapture. But in chapter 18, as we go through the next six things that we see in this set of scripture, it'll point out very quickly to us that these two, 17 and 18, point to two very different things. The first thing is this. In verse 1, John says, after this... Okay, we could stop right there. That's the very first thing. He says, after this, meaning after the events of chapter 17, this happens. So after the destruction of the religious side of Babylon comes the destruction of the city. And this tells us that these events in chapter 18 don't take place until after the events of chapter 17 are fulfilled. 
And so that's what we see as uh, the first thing in your notes there is that, um, that chapter 17 has to be fulfilled and then chapter 18 will occur. Uh, John is very clear about that. He says, after this. I mean, there's, there's no way to expound on that. There's no way to uh, expand on that. But that's basically what he's saying there is that, you know, once 18 is, or 17 is done, chapter 18 happens. And so it, it, to him, he's seeing this all in, in sequence. Uh, not only that, but in verse 1, he also says, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. And so obviously the angel mentioned in chapter 17 is a different angel than the angel mentioned in chapter 18. And so these are two different angels. Uh, and the event, you know, they're not the same one uh, who introduced the different events. Uh, you know, the one in chapter 17 was one of the seven who was given one of the bold judgments. And so this one is an altogether different angel whose uh, majesty or glory, I guess you would say, illuminates the whole earth. Uh, but what we also see in this is that the names in the two chapters are different because the name in chapter 18 is simply Babylon the Great. You remember there was a long name in chapter 17 for uh, Babylon. It said in there, it said, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. And so that was this big long name. And here in chapter, eight to, in chapter 18, it's just simply Babylon the Great. The only similarity, as I mentioned earlier, is the location. The religion of that day will find its center to be that of Babylon. And that will be the same governmental and commercial head of the world during that time. Antichrist will basically put his throne, if you want to call it that. That will be the seat of his power, will be in Babylon. Uh, there is question as to whether that is the, the actual city of Babylon. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Or whether it is another city that is representative of Babylon. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. But really all we see in chapter 17 and 18 is that the, the religious portion of it in the the religious portion of Babylon that world religion will be destroyed in the middle of the tribulation and that will be in that city of Babylon three and a half years later nearly the governmental side the commercial side of it will be destroyed as well uh, also we see that Babylon uh, the the prostitute as we talk about in chapter 17 is destroyed by the kings of the earth we saw that last week but because the kings of the earth are the ones that help the Antichrist to do away with this world religion that is uh, basically uh, the main power of that day. But chapter 18 shows us uh, that uh, when the destruction of Babylon occurs of the city, it's because of the judgments of God. And so it's not that the kings come in, and we'll see something about that here in just a moment, but what we see is that these are God's judgments against Babylon, and he is bringing, he's raining down fire and, and doing all of these other cataclysmic uh, judgments on Babylon. Now here is the thing that really helps us to sort of also see that these are two different events and timetables, because uh, and the fifth thing is that the kings who destroy uh, the Babylon of chapter 17, they rejoice. Okay, they get, They're happy because they have defeated this one world religion that is flexing its, its might, flexing its power over the world in the first half of the tribulation. They rejoice because that power is no longer there. So that religious Babylon is no longer in the picture and they're happy about it. But what we see is, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, here in chapter 18, when Babylon is destroyed, the kings and the merchants and the sea captains, they all lament. They all weep for her. They're mourning. They're putting uh, dust on their heads in a sign of mourning as uh, we read about throughout the Bible. They're sad. So how can they be happy that Babylon was destroyed in one chapter and then sad that it was destroyed in the, in the next chapter and it be the same thing? It's not possible. So that just further shows us that we're talking about two different things here because of their lamenting and their weeping for uh, Babylon. But the final thing that we see <clears throat> is that if chapter 17 and 18 take place during the last days of the tribulation, okay, if for some reason these were to both take place at the very end of the tribulation, right before the glorious appearing, 
There would be no place for the Antichrist and the false prophet to do away with all the religions and then substitute the worship of the Antichrist as we see talked about in chapter 13. Okay, so what we see is that, that because we know that the Antichrist rises to power and throws off the religious uh, powers of that day in the midpoint of the tribulation, that gives him three and a half years to be able to develop his own worship. You know, the false prophet immediately sets up this image and it speaks and, and does things and people are receiving the mark of the beast and they are uh, required to worship the Antichrist. And all of this happens after that midway point when the Antichrist defeats and destroys the religious one world religion. And so with that being the case, now he has that time period. But if both of those occurred at the same time, Time at the end of the tribulation period, he wouldn't have time to set up that worship of himself. And so it just goes further to show us that these are two different things. That chapter 17 refers to the religion, that one world religion that will take hold right after the rapture. And chapter 18 refers to the uh, end of the tribulation period and the destruction of the city of Babylon where the Antichrist had his uh, his basically his capital and so what we see is that you know, that was all in chapter that was all in verse one basically <laughs> you know according to the way the notes look but we see that in verses one and two it talks about babylon the great is fallen and uh you know it says there in your notes that another angel again not the same one as in chapter 17 who has great authority, he lights the entire earth with his glory. That's, that's different than the seven angels that we talked about who had the bold judgments, and one of those uh, was represented in chapter 17. But what we see is that he comes out and he says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And so he is calling out the destruction or, or describing the destruction of the greatest city ever uh, developed in the known world. Uh, we, we know that what happens here is that this city, it will, you know, uh, will be representative of all things that man has accomplished. There'll be music and art, and there'll be commerce, there'll be, you know, financial things, and all of these things will be a part of the city. But what we know is that the, the Antichrist makes this his uh, governmental seat. This will be his, his capital. This is where he will rule from, and it will be... Mankind during the tribulation period will think a lot of this city. They, it will be, it will be a, a grand city, as man would call it. Uh, but as we know, the geographical location of this city is not given in the scriptures. It doesn't say Babylon in the middle of you know, the Arabian desert or anything like that. It does say that, you know, we just know that it's Babylon. Now, some suggest, as your notes say, some suggest that it is in economic centers, such as possibly uh, New York City or others that have big financial hubs. And so um, some believe it might be that, or maybe even because of Rome's uh, religious, uh, religious uh, areas like the Vatican and the... the Roman Catholic churches, uh, 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 their hold on the city of Rome, what we would see is that some believe that it might be uh, the city of Rome. But, but the thing is, there are those who also believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible that uh, believe that Babylon will be rebuilt, that it will, in the, in the middle of Iraq, where it is today, not far from the city of Hilla, uh, in central uh, in central Iraq, not, not far south of uh, the capital of Baghdad, um, there is the ruins of Babylon. They, they know where it's at. It's not hidden or anything like that. Um, and if you get on Google Maps, you can actually find it. Uh, it's very easy to find. But uh, nevertheless, um, some believe that that will become this grand uh, economic center. And with the world in the shape that it is right now, we couldn't see that happening. Uh, we just, you know, just sort of, that's a far, far off idea that we don't think would normally happen because of the, uh, the aftermath of the uh, war in Iraq. It would just be hard for us to imagine that there would ever be this great commerce center in the, in the center of Iraq that wouldn't be destroyed by ISIS or whatever. 
But if we believe the Bible to tell us what it says, you know, some believe, like I said, that it could be New York or Rome or some other city. But it very well could be that it's rebuilt there where it's at, uh, where, this, where the foundations of the original city of Babylon are at. And the author in the commentary makes a really good argument for why it will be rebuilt in the city, uh, in the, in, on the foundations basically of where the old city of Babylon was at. And what he references, and the more I have thought about it this week, the more I, I tend to believe or, or agree with him in the fact that it would be the city of the former Babylon. And the reason for that is this. Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 have prophecies about Babylon that have not yet been fulfilled. Okay, And so if those have not been fulfilled, then what that means is that they, they are yet to be accomplished and that God will fulfill those. And those, um, those prophecies have to do with, uh, among other things, that there will be no inhabitants, no new inhabitants in the city of Babylon after its destruction as we understand it in chapter 18. Well, people for the last you know, couple thousand years have been inhabiting that area. There are people that live basically in that you know, village of Babylon, that area of Babylon right now. And so that, that prophecy has not been fulfilled. Another one is that no stone will be reused from the city of Babylon. And that's one of the things that is talked about in, in, uh, in either Isaiah or in Jeremiah. But the, the stones from the old city of Babylon have been used to build uh, cities throughout the Middle East uh, in ancient history. It, there's recordings of that. And so that's not been fulfilled. And the other is that there will be a sudden destruction. It will come really quickly and Babylon will be basically wiped off the face of the earth. The, when Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar was at, where uh, where uh, Daniel was at and where we read about the captives being taken all of that Ezra and all of those when we read about those the destruction of, of Babylon was a slow and gradual decline it wasn't sudden and then all of a sudden you know the city was wiped off the map it was slowly faded into obscurity and then would it, eventually it rebounded and was even uh, you know a, a relatively good sized town at one point but nevertheless, those prophecies have not been fulfilled yet. So it makes sense to us that the only opportunity for there to be no inhabitants, for the stones of the city to never be reused, and for it to be a sudden destruction would be what is described in Revelation chapter 18. And so that makes us imagine that, that this rebuilding project will occur in what is the middle of Iraq. So that makes it even... Uh, more interesting uh, for us to study this. But nevertheless, we know that there is this coming destruction of Babylon. Now, whether it is rebuilt physically there in the middle of Iraq or whether it is rebuilt symbolically, as your notes say there, uh, this great city of Babylon will be the, it'll be the governmental, the religious and commercial centers of the whole world at that time. It will be the, it will be the, city where people will want to go because if they're religious they're going to want to go there to worship if they are greedy or if they are in business or if they are looking to make money in some form or fashion they're going to go there because it will be the commercial center of the world and so if they are looking for a governmental position in this new one world uh Government that the Antichrist sets up, well, they've got to go to where the capital is, and that will be Babylon. And so they will, there will be people looking to come to that. But as we read in chapter 18, you know, it, it's, it's very repetitive when it talks about uh, the kings, the merchants, and the sailors, uh, or the sea captains. They're going to stand off and, as this city is destroyed, and they're going to be weeping. They're going to be sad. They're going to be uh, distraught over it because what they see is that when this happens, their main concern is not for the inhabitants of the city. They're going to be concerned because they're no longer going to be able to make money. 
That's what they're worried about. They're worried about their, their financial investments. They're worried about their, their money. They're going to be worried about all of those things because in that city, they will be able to, as your notes sort of reference, they'll be able to uh, have this gratification of the flesh in every form and fashion. You know, they'll, they'll have the money. They'll have all of the other things that uh, anything that they could ever want, they will have available to them in Babylon. And now all of a sudden that's gone. And with that being gone, they're going to be sad <laughs> because, you know, yes, they're going to have lost their financial standing and all of their commercial businesses and things like that. But here is the catch. They've got a matter of days, months at best between the destruction of Babylon and the return of Christ because we don't have the timeline told. We're, we're not told that. But they have just you know maybe days or weeks maybe a month or two we don't we don't know but there is a very short period of time uh between the destruction of babylon and then the glorious appearing the return of christ and the start of the millennial uh reign and we'll we'll look at all that in the coming weeks but there all of that will happen they're not going to have the opportunity to rebuild babylon they're not going to have the opportunity to mourn this great wealth that they've lost very long because that city will be destroyed and before long many of them will be destroyed as well uh, as, uh, as we'll read in the coming weeks. But what we see is that um, this angel, as is, uh, it says in verse 21, it says, Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and then gave this, uh, this, these comments that we read in the rest of those verses. And basically what we see here is that this angel is throwing down this great millstone, this great boulder as it says. And this is symbolizing something for us about the destruction of Babylon. It symbolizes the permanence of it and the suddenness of the destruction of Babylon. So this, uh, this millstone or this big boulder being cast into the sea is representative it is a symbol it is a sign of what is to happen with the um with the city of babylon it means that this is going to be a permanent destruction because think about it how are you going to get a millstone off the bottom of the ocean you don't <laughs> it stays there uh you know you toss a little rock into the creek yeah you can go pick it up and pull it back out but you toss a millstone something used for grinding you toss that into the sea you ain't getting that back out. And so it's permanent. It's permanently <laughs> residing at the bottom of the ocean. Just like Babylon is permanently being destroyed at this time. But also it's the suddenness of it. You know, for that, it's not going to gradually slip into the water. If you toss a rock into the water, it's not going to gradually float and hit the water and you go down. You throw a rock in the water and it's going to sink like a rock for a reason because it's heavy and it's dense and it's going to go straight to the bottom. Well, that's the same kind of destruction that Babylon is going to experience. It's going to be permanent, but it's going to be sudden. And so uh, it's going to happen uh, very quickly. And, uh, you know, we, we have already read how this uh, will be by earthquakes and thunder and lightning, plagues, uh, death, uh, mourning and famine and all of this. And it says in verse 18 that she will be consumed, talking about the city of Babylon, she will be consumed by fire. Now, if you're reading in the book uh, that we're studying through as we go through this, one interesting thing that I thought was kind of neat was that uh, uh, a guide who leads people around there in Babylon, or at least when they were writing the book 20 years ago, uh, shared how about uh, below the surface of the ground, about 10 feet below, there was this layer of tar in the in the in the surface I mean, below the surface of the ground there in uh, the area where Babylon was at and the author makes the correlation between how this layer of tar that is below the sand in this area very well could uh, be the uh, the source of the flame that eventually destroys the city of Babylon because think if it's built on a big tar pit and that tar lights up then the city's going to be destroyed and so that makes sense. Now, we understand that the, you know, those areas are rich in petroleum deposits as well. I mean, you know, we, we saw how Saddam Hussein would light uh, 
uh, oil wells on fire, even during the uh, desert storm and even uh, later uh, in the war with uh, war for uh, Iraq, we see that um, those sort of things would happen. So it's not unheard of for those sort of things to happen in that area. And so this very well could be the, the way that it is destroyed by fire. We just, you know, we don't know. Um, but, you know, your notes mention there about how the light of life uh, is destroyed. And basically the darkness, as it says there, with which Babylon will be permanently or perpetually shrouded is a testimony to the lifelessness uh, for eternity. And basically saying that, you know, for the rest of eternity, there will never, you know, Babylon's not going to be rebuilt. After it is rebuilt and then destroyed, it's never coming back. Uh, Babylon has been a thorn in the side of God, if you want to, in his plan for mankind since it was founded by Nimrod shortly after the, after the uh, flood. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, the devotional that me and the boys have been going through. Uh, we talked recently, we just talked this past week about uh, the Tower of Babel and how uh, right after the, uh, after the flood, Nimrod founded uh, cities and one thing and another, and one of the cities that he founded was Babylon. Even though it wasn't called Babylon then, it was called Babel and one thing and another. But, uh, you know, the boys, I said, what do you, I said, to us, Nimrod is a, is a, is a sort of a derogatory name. You know, it's a name where you, I said, what, what is a person that's a Nimrod? And they said, somebody that's stupid. You know, something like that. You know, one of them said something like that. And I said, well, I said, yeah, I said, that's basically it. I said, we think of a Nimrod. We don't think of someone who is wise and intelligent in that regard. But, you know, Nim, Nimrod, as we read in the scriptures, from a worldly perspective, he was very intelligent because he, he, he helped to start cities to begin with. But that, that shoehorned man into a particular place where they weren't able to fulfill God's design for their life, as we read about later in the scriptures, or earlier in the scriptures, technically. But what we see is that this, you know, even from thousands of years ago when Nimrod founded the city of Babylon, uh, it has continued to cause problems for God. I mean, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar was there and he took the Jews into uh, captivity, even though that was part of God's plan, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a challenging place. But after its destruction in what we read to be Revelation 18, it's done. It, it's not coming back. Uh, you know, one thing that you see there in your notes, it says, just as God chose Jerusalem... As his headquarters to win the souls of people, Satan chose Babylon as his capital to destroy them. And that's really what's happened, is that God has placed his anointing, he has placed his presence at, different, at, at one time in Jerusalem, and that was to be the, the center of, uh, of the nation of Israel. It, was to be the, it ended up being the place where his son was crucified. And because of Jerusalem being Jerusalem, we have a place there where we know that Christ was uh, crucified and our faith was started because of the death of Christ there. But we also know that Satan, just like God, because Satan imitates and mimics God on so many levels, we know that Satan uh, wanted a capital city as well, if you want to call it that, and Babylon was his capital city. You know, now the author makes a good argument for how, um, how, the, uh, how Satan moved it once Babylon was no longer influential like it had been, uh, the, the literal city of Babylon. He you know, says that Satan moved his, uh, his capital to Pergamum, which is referenced at the beginning of, uh, of Revelation as being the place where Satan has his throne. And uh, then uh, mentions how... Uh, how Bab the the idea of this Babylon was moved to Rome, and he, he talks about it in the book. It's it's you know it's interesting to read, and I'd encourage you to do that if you haven't. But what we see is that this capital that uh, Satan has used, he's used it to destroy lives since it was founded by Nimrod all those years ago, and God uses Jerusalem to do the exact opposite. He uses it. As he used it as a place where Christ would be crucified and we would receive eternal life. The final thing that we see, though, in this chapter is uh, in verses 4 and 5. Now, we didn't talk about this earlier as we were going through, but in verses 4 and 5, we read about God's merciful call to his people. 
And what we see here is that in verse 4, we see that there are these people that are referred to as my people. God says, you know, these are my people. And he says, uh, he says, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins that are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. And so basically what happens is Jesus, or God makes this, this call to those that are in Babylon that are his people. Now, uh, the question is, who are these people? One is they could be tribulation saints, those that have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. After the rapture, they weren't Christians before the rapture. The rapture happens and they could be tribulation saints, those that become Christians during the tribulation. The second thing is they could be uh, Israelites who have not repented and started to follow Christ. Uh, who, I'm sorry, yeah, who have not repented and followed Christ. So they may be Israelites who have still yet to become Christian. And so uh, we're not exactly sure who these my people are, but what we see is that uh, he's wanting them to come out of Babylon so that they don't get wrapped up in their sins, in the sins of Babylon, but he also wants them to do that so that they don't receive part of the judgment of Babylon. It's sort of the same, you know, the, the author of the commentary makes the, the uh, same comment or the, the idea that some of us are probably thinking of is sort of an it's sort of a reference to Lot and his family and the city of cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed uh, during you know by God, and God was merciful and gave Lot and his family the option of being able to leave. And that's basically what God is offering to these people just prior to the destruction of Babylon, just prior to the glorious appearing of God, and so. Uh, we see that what happens is we've led up to the end of the tribulation period and the only thing we have left to see is the return of Christ. And so in chapter 19, uh, we'll start that uh, next week. The thing that I need to sort of warn you about is chapter 19 is a long chapter, okay? And the way that we're going to pursue chapter 19 is we're going, we're going to start on it next week. I don't suspect that we will end it next week, but we're going to work on it and try and get it, get as much of it done as we can. And if we have to go to the next week to finish chapter 19, we will. If it takes three weeks, we'll take that. The chapter 19 is a very big chapter in regards to what happens at this time, because you're talking about the return of Christ, the defeat of the Antichrist, and uh, the defeat of the false prophet, and, and all that goes on during that time. And so the next couple of, the, at least next week, if not the next couple of weeks, are going to be kind of uh, jam-packed with a lot of, for us to, uh, to comprehend. And so uh, be prepared. We may not get all the way through 19 next week.